last week with um, Life Lessons from Jacob, and so we're going to do part two of Life Lessons from Jacob, and it's titled, is it up there? Yep, Wrestling with God. I like that picture up there. Wrestling with God. Wrestling with God. So uh, we learned so far that in the whole life of Jacob, you really see transformation. You know, a lot of the biblical characters you see in the Bible doesn't talk in depth of their struggles. Well, Jacob definitely goes in depth with struggles. Who here struggles sometimes? <laughs> All of us, amen? Oh, I thought, Diane, you weren't going to... Oh, I saw it. The last... <laughs> <laughs> so we can all struggle a lot. So Jacob is somebody that we can learn a lot from. And so we're taking our time with Jacob. Next week, I just remembered like yesterday that I'm not going to be here next Wednesday. So I thought, uh-oh, who's going to speak next Wednesday? We're going to be going into Joseph. So I thought, hmm, who would be a good person to speak on Joseph? How about Joseph? <laughs> Joe DiMaglio. <laughs> yeah. So I don't even think, I didn't even tell Pastor Steve that yet, but Joe DiMaglio is going to be speaking with you next week on um, Joseph, so it should be good. Yeah, I did tell him yesterday, and he, uh, or Monday, yeah, he said he would do that, so. All right, so here we go with Jacob. So Jacob covers a lot of um, chapters in the Bible. So, of course, we don't have the time to go over every chapter and read the story. Since most of you have been, you all know the Word of God, right? Some of you grew up in Sunday school, heard the Bible stories. So we can just kind of go over a little bit and then go into application. So we're going to cover, first of all, Genesis chapter 29 through 31. And this is the story of Jacob and Lab Laban. Laban. Laban's the right way to say it, right? And this part I'm titling, Dealing with the Consequences of Our Past. If we had a magic wand and we could just, our past, <laughs> and it's gone, who would love that? Just to wake up, you gave your life to the Lord, you wake up, and the past was just completely gone. And by faith, it is. And in Christ, we are a brand new creature. The struggle we have is being in Christ and not in Christ. We go in and out. And that's why our past still can sometimes haunt us. And we still have difficulties. So we're going to go into detail on that, but let's um, just paraphrase a little bit chapter 29 through 31. So here's Jacob. He um, wants to obey his dad. His dad, Isaac, told him to go marry somebody from his, with his, within his own family line. So he heads to Paddan Aram. And upon that way, he goes into, he finds a well, and very similar to Isaac's story with... Um, Rebecca, Jacob finds his wife at the well, or at least the woman he wants to marry. Sometimes you want to marry somebody, but it doesn't come. Who here had a difficult time getting a hold of their wife? Meaning, she didn't come easy. She came with a price. You had to earn it. Anybody? Or was it easy? Russ? Pretty easy. <laughs> Mine, that was pretty easy for me too, but anyway, we're going to find out Jacob, it wasn't too easy for Jacob, but it wasn't because so much Rachel, it was because of Rachel's family. Anybody ever marry somebody and then like, the problem isn't so much your spouse, it's the family that you married into. <laughs> And all its drama. Sometimes people get divorced not because of really each other, but because of all the problems, all the baggage from the whole family. So here we go. Jacob comes to the well. He re Rachel's the woman he wants. And uh, he, Rachel brings him home to her dad, Laban, and Laban. Laban. Sorry. Laban. And Laban... Laban. That's it. Come on. So Laban decides, okay, you can have my wife, but you know what? I need some extra help around here. You can have her, but you're going to work. You're going to have to work seven years for her. You can have my daughter, right? Yeah, you're going to have my daughter, but you're going to have to work seven years. Yeah, you got it? I said wife, I said a daughter. Oh. Well, 
oh, daughter, going to be wife. Sorry, thanks for correcting. So anyway, Jacob works really hard to marry Rachel. But when it comes down to it, Leah was the firstborn. It was supposed to be her that marries first. So Laban tricked Jacob, and Jacob woke up the next morning, and it wasn't Rachel next to him. It was Leah. So now Jacob had to work another seven years in order to have Rachel have both wives. So Jacob works really, really hard for Laban. And Laban, is it Laban? Yes. <laughs> oh, I'm just going to say L. Or the, the dude. How about this, the dude? So Jacob really works hard for this guy. Have you ever felt used and abused by family members? Hello, somebody? Have I ever been there before? I don't know. I'm not going to tell you. I'm pretty transparent, but we're not going to go that, that transparent tonight. <laughs> <laughs> but you can um, really be taken advantage of by your family sometimes. So finally, they okay, so um, there they are. They get married. Jacob works real hard. He has both wives now. But he continues to work hard and hard and hard. He has many children now. As we're going to see, the 12 tribes of Israel came from Jacob. And going into chapter 30, um, after all this hard work, God's blessing upon Jacob makes Laban rich, wealthy. And Laban doesn't want to let him go. But at some point, when you've been in, you know, it's difficult. I lasted one week in my grandma's home after I got married. And I was like, I don't know how I'm going to do it. I don't have any money. I don't have two pennies to rub together. Just came out of the mission field. But I'm going to move out, and I'm going to find a way to make it. Because I can't live under my grandma's household. That's just how I was. I needed to learn. I needed to be independent. Here, Jacob is living for 14 plus years with, um, under that household, and he's ready to go. Time has come. I want to split, but Laban doesn't want to let him go because Laban is blessed because of him. So Laban tries to figure a way to keep him. And so Jacob comes up with an idea. So we're going to find out through the help of God and frees himself from Laban. And finally gets out of that household on his way, but Laban comes after him. He doesn't want to let him go that easy. He had to sneak out at night because Jacob knew how Laban was. Laban found out and went after him, tried to make sure that Jacob didn't get away. But God showed up in the midst of it, and God always has a way to deliver us. Okay, so that's just a little bit of the story of Jacob and Laban, but let's now go into some of the life lessons. First, on the next slide, this is a really powerful uh, saying here that really sums up this story. A complex plot intertwines the past pains into the present difficulties and challenges the characters to grow. Say what? If you break that down, it's very deep. It takes some meditating on though. A complex plot. Okay, what's that? Who here, sometimes their life gets pretty complex. It's like drama, like Lifetime. Ladies, Lifetime lovers out there. Soap operas, your life is like a living soap opera. Little complex. Why? Because it, our life sometimes intertwines with the past pains and makes forth our present difficulties. But in the midst of it, it can be our challenge, it can be the challenge that allows our character to grow. Okay, let's break that down a little more. So life lessons from Jacob and Laban. So we understand that God forgives us of our sins. We all believe that, right? But does that mean that our past choices won't make our present difficult at times? Do we still have consequences to our past to deal with? They don't just go away? 
Okay, because we, we, the world abides under the laws of God. And one of the laws of God is, is the golden rule. What's the golden rule? How you treat others will be how you're treated yourself. So if we have wronged people in our past... Don't think just because we got saved that those people are going to be, okay, that's fine. Life goes on. You're, you're, you're a Christian now. I'm cool with you now. No big deal. No, and especially family members. Family who have grown up with us, they've seen us at the worst of times, are not just going to be like, okay, you're changed all of a sudden because you went forward to the altar. They're going to make it probably, it's usually family that makes it the hardest, or the hardest people on us. Because they've seen us, you know, in our, in our worst of times. So we can't expect people just to treat us differently just because we're now saying that we're Christians and we go to church now. Okay, we've treated people wrong and those people are probably going to treat us wrong because of that. And that's not going to change for a while until they see consistency over time and that change in us will begin to twickle down and change the people around us. But it's not easy. The only way to get through some of our problems is simply we got to accept the consequence of our past. We just got to accept it. It is what it is. We can't get out of the problem that we're in. Some of us, maybe, we married somebody for the wrong reason, but we're married to them. Are they easy to deal with? No. But what can we do about it? Okay, we can do it the world way and just get a divorce, but we can do it the God's way and believe that God is going to transform our spouse. So trusting God and waiting for him to deliver us is sometimes the only way. Jacob had to deal with the, the, the hurt that he did to so many. He was a schemer, and next thing you know, he was being schemed. And he had to learn some lessons. He had to build some character. So his journey of dealing with past, the past choices, his current conflict, consequences, took a long time to get out of. But it was necessary for Jacob to change. So we cannot avoid God's refining process. When you mine gold, the only way that gold is going to look pure enough that you'd want to wear it on your finger or around your neck or on your wrist is if it goes through the fire. Because gold mine does not look good. And neither do we when we first give our life to the Lord. For us to look good, we got to go through the fire. And Jacob was going through the fire and so must we. And sometimes that fire, it is. It's our past that continues to haunt us. Yes, we're in, we are brand new creatures in Christ Jesus. But again, like I said, the problem is we have is we're learning how to remain in Christ. And until we get there, we're going to be in and out. And while we're out, there's going to be some things to deal with. Support can be very helpful during time of transition. But if someone gets comfortable with receiving freeness, we all like free things, right? But sometimes free things can cripple us. Those who are under welfare, welfare can be helpful, but it can be damaging as well. It can be a good thing to help us during transition, but if we never transition because we become comfortable with receiving freeness, we never advance and we stay stuck where we're at. Jacob here, his father-in-law and, and that family were enjoying the blessing upon his life. They were being supported by Jacob. Jacob worked, all his hard work was for them. He hardly got to receive anything for himself. Laban was always changing the wages. He was always doing him wrong. But because he loved Rachel and, 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 and Leah, well, at least Rachel, he did whatever it, he had to do, just the way it was. So, 
there it comes to a point when we're helping somebody, supporting them, that our help is no longer helping, but hurting. So we can help somebody so much that it actually hurts them because now we're causing them not to advance, not to grow up, not to develop because they're not learning how to rely upon God on their own. Everyone needs to learn to trust God for themselves. So we cannot enable people. There's a time to help people, but there's a time to let go and let them learn for themselves. Amen. So Jacob finally got to the point where I need to go. I'm not going to support Laban for the rest of my life. I need, I'm working hard and I want this hard work to go towards my family alone. And during this process, in the next slide, advantages versus disadvantages. Remember, Jacob had, you know, had learned to, he had lived on his own all his life, scheming and surviving, trying to make it however he could. Then he had the supernatural encounter of God, and now he's going through learning how to trust God instead of trusting himself. And so through this whole thing, he's seeing God's hand upon him. He's seeing that he has way more advantages now with God then he has the disadvantage he had apart from God. And we, we have so much advantages than the world has. Having God with us, we just got way, we got it way above everyone else. Upon our job, upon, you know, anything we do with God, we got the upper hand. We just got to learn how to rely on him, learn how to rest in him, learn how to wait on him, learn how to hear from him. Learn how to receive his guidance, his wisdom. It's there. Wisdom is always in the air. It just needs ears that are willing to listen. So in this situation where Laban was refusing to let Jacob go, Jacob had to learn how to rely on him and God gave him a way of wisdom because Jacob told Laban, I will take whatever, the wealth that I'll take, because Laban said, okay, I know I owe you, I'll give you whatever you want. I'll pay the wages I own Laban. And Jacob said, no, just give me the sheep. And so God gave Jacob a wise way to, to um, make sure that the sheep, he said he would take the spotted and the striped sheep, and, Jacob, and then Laban could take the pure um, white sheep, and uh, he, God gave him a way that all the sheep, or a majority of the sheep, would become spotted and striped. And so, through that, Jacob became wealthy. Because he listened to God. So, if we would just listen to God, God would take care of us. All the time, every time, above and beyond. God has a way out of every situation we are facing. There's always a way out. We just have to learn to wait and follow his leading and not resort to our old way of dealing with things. When people do us wrong, are we going to respond the way we used to? Or the way we now know in Christ Jesus? Are we going to turn our cheek? Or are we going to punch, hit, kick, do whatever it takes to get what we say is ours? We've got to learn to trust God. And if we learn to trust God, God will fight our battles and God will bring the victory. Amen? Yes. Next slide. So God has given us a way of outwitting our enemies. God's blessings make us rich. We don't need to scheme to get wealth, but be obedient to his purposes. God, as you see, through all the Bible characters we're going to talk about, the majority of them, maybe all of them, were wealthy. But what were they doing? They were discipling nations. They were establishing great things for God. They needed wealth to follow through with God's will for their lives, with God's purposes. So when we are all about God's business, God takes care of us. His blessings make us rich. There is nothing wrong with desiring wealth if it is all about desiring to fulfill the will of God. Amen? 
So now let's go to Jacob and Esau. From one conflict to the next. Okay. We've got to understand that when we get saved, things don't just become perfect overnight. God wants our hearts. And that means everything of our past we must surrender. And so he'll bring up one thing after another until it's completely gone. And Satan, though, will never allow us, as long as we're on this earth, to forget our past if we allow him. Satan, all he has on us is our past. So don't think it is just going to disappear. He's always going to try to bring it back to us. Because that is how he works. Okay, that's all he has on us. So any chance we give him, he's going to bring it back. But we don't have to beat ourselves up. We just have to know that is the work of the enemy. That's how he operates. Okay, as long as we are human, we're in this flesh... There's going to be a battle, and he's going to bring that back into our life, and we just have to now confess God's word. So Jacob and Esau, let's talk about necessary conflict. Who here does not like to deal with conflict? If you could avoid it, you would. How often do we avoid conflict, and because we avoid it, it's still there, and when we finally now have to deal with it, it's much bigger than it would be if we had dealt with it way back. You can't ignore certain things. Certain things, we got to understand that God won't allow us to ignore. God has a way to bring things. We can run from it, just like Jonah. And we're going to go into Jonah at some point. But it's gonna, he's going to bring us back to what he wants us to do. So how to deal with, well, let's first start, talk about, sorry, let's talk about Jacob and Esau, Genesis 32 and 33. So we know Esau is Jacob's brother. Jacob stole Esau's birthright. So expected, Jacob and Esau went their own ways. Esau hated Jacob, and Jacob feared Esau. So Jacob was always walking forward, looking behind. Somebody's out to get me. My brother's going to eventually get, find me and deal with me for what I've done. So in Genesis 32, we see that um, Jacob is... He's moving forward to where he, where he wants to go, back to his homeland, but in the midst, he knows he's going to have to deal with his brother. And that causes him to really lose it. He starts getting paranoid. He starts, and he starts dealing with things in a rash manner until he finally consults God. And then he wrestles with God. And we're going to go into what that means. And following that, God deals with Jacob, deals with Esau. And everything ends up turning out not too bad. Jake, Esau doesn't have any, you know, any uh, unforgiveness or doesn't want to do uh, Jacob any, any harm. The two come at peace with each other and go their separate ways with total peace. So that's basically the story of Jacob and, I mean, and, yeah, Jacob and Esau. But let's go into some life lessons from that story. So how to deal with conflict. First of all, from an example of Jacob, we should not panic when conflict comes. Because if we panic, we will make rash decisions that we will later regret. Okay, if we can, we should always, we just need to pray for God to give us the grace to take always a step back before we take a step forward. To get in our prayer closet before we confront somebody. Because I have confronted people, and the worst thing, don't confront people on Facebook. <laughs> you ever had those long it's not worth it make sure you pray before you respond to anybody's anything from however don't email don't just it's best to confront somebody straight up face to face but first to pray to, a, to assure a problem will end well prayer should always be established from where the beginning 
prayer should always be established from the beginning. Now, when we go to God in prayer, we need to approach God in humility. That's the key to getting his response. Sometimes we pray religiously. Like one time I was going to confront somebody uh, that had done something to my wife and um, I went to confront the person. I prayed, but I already had set my mind what I was going to do. I set my mind that I was going to get in the person's face if need be. And so I went there and did, the person did respond exactly like I thought he would. He stepped forward towards my wife. So I picked him up by his neck and slammed him against a wall and almost got arrested as a pastor, as a minister years ago. Because I'd already set my mind. I prayed, but I already set my mind. I really wasn't listening to God. I didn't humble myself before the Lord. I was already proudly, you know, I was in my pride going to do it my way. I was just being religious. So we need to approach God in humility, meaning we're not going to just tell God what we're going to do. We're going to listen to God what he wants us to do. So approaching God in humility is key to getting his response. We must understand that God does not owe us anything. It is by his mercy that he promises any good thing. People think God owes them something. They're just demanding God to do this, demanding God to do that. God don't have to do a thing for us by his mercy. So there is always a strategy to win if we give ear to the victorious one through humility. We humble ourselves before God and we wait and we listen. And if we listen, Christ, God, I mean, has already established victory through Christ. And all we have to do is listen to him, give ear long enough, and eventually the answer will come to bring victory in any situation we are facing. Amen? Amen. Now let's look at the scriptures though. There's just one passage I really wanted to look into and that is the wrestling with God that Jacob did. So let's look at Genesis 32 verse 24. This left Jacob all alone in the camp and a man, which is God, came and wrestled with him until the dawn began to break. When the man saw that he would not win the match, he touched Jacob's hip and wretched, wretched it out of its socket. Then the man said, let me go for the dawn is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. What is your name? The man asked. He replied, Jacob. Your name will no longer be Jacob, the man told him. From now on you will be called Israel because you have fought with God and with men and have won. That's why my son named Israel just hit me. He's like, no matter what, he always wins. <laughs> he just keeps pushing and pushing and pushing until he gets what he wants. He knows how to just keep at me and keep at me until I finally say, okay, okay. That might be being spoiled, but he is Israel. Please tell me your name, Jacob said. Why do you want to know my name, the man replied. Then he blessed Jacob there. Jacob named the place Peniel, which means face of God. For he said, I have seen God face to face, yet my life has been spared. So this is just a, you know, a very deep theological thing that we could go into. God wrestling with Jacob. Okay, but I'm just going to give you what I believe could help us with this whole understanding. So I might not give you the right answer to how could God actually wrestle with man and how could man win. But this is what I came as I was meditating on this. Why, first of all, the question is, why do we struggle? You ever ask yourself that? Now that I'm in Christ, why do I continue to struggle? Why does this battle continue on, on and on and on? See, our problems are not really with man, but with God. Huh? We think our problems are with, with somebody. We're pointing fingers at people, all the people that have done us wrong and, and our, you know, our boss and our family members and whoever. But the problem really is with God. What? Okay. A crisis will be prolonged until we learn our lesson. Whatever crisis we're in will be prolonged until we learn our lesson. 
The, pro- the struggle is the wrestle. We're wrestling with God. Until we surrender our entire heart to God, issues will remain. Until we fully trust God in every area of our life, that means with our money, that means with our future, that means with our family members, that means with our job, that means everything. Until we fully surrender it and trust God, no matter how it may seem in the natural, there's still issues and therefore conflict and struggle that will remain. We must go beyond faith in God to relationship with God. What does that mean? Well, beyond receiving handouts, I have faith in God to believe for this, but God wants us more to be than just people that are beggars who just receiving to God's ultimate desire, his main reason that he saved us, and the main reason he created us was to have a face-to-face relationship, to have an encounter. So Jacob's wrestling with God was to bring Jacob to a point where he was no longer wrestling with man Scheming and scheming and striving and worrying about what Esau and Laban had done, but now he was learning to surrender to God. And him having victory meant God now was Lord of his life. And we see that Jacob now had um, what was it exactly a hip? hip. Yeah, the hip. Wrenched out. Wrenched out, whatever that was like. <laughs> to me, that was, you know, reminding us that some of us, we have scars of our past, right? Sometimes it might be physical scars in our body. You know, things in our life. You know, I was talking to somebody who, um, who sometimes the holidays t- times bring up all the memories of, of the hurts of their past with their loved ones or, you know, the loved ones that hurt them. And try to direct, and there's a few different people I've been praying for, try to direct them that don't take these things and, and, as something to be bitter about. But instead, make it something you can be better about. Because every time these thoughts come to our mind, these things resurface, we can now turn it around as a memorial to God of where, what he has brought us out of. That these things can actually make us better. Because if it wasn't for these people that hurt us, these, and these situations that we've been through, we wouldn't have discovered the God that we know now as we know him. Amen. Because we are where we're at now because God has brought us through. Therefore, there's no regret anymore. These things have been necessary to bring us to that place of brokenness and humility where Jesus Christ could truly be the Lord of our life. Amen? So bitter or better, it's our choice. We have the choice. Nobody has to continue to hold on to us. It's our choice that we stay held on to them through unforgiveness. It's our choice. We can say, it's, they did me this. Yeah, they did, but that's back then. And we still stay hold to back then because we make the choice to be better, bitter rather than better. So when we forgive, we let go. And we become better for it rather than worse for it. Amen? Amen. So confronting our fears. Jacob confronted his fear. He dealt with his brother. But have you ever feared conflict with somebody? And you feared it and you feared it and you're like, oh, you're just so wish that there was some way to get around it, to get over it, to not deal with it. And then when you finally had just dealt with it, it really wasn't that bad. So when God is in it, he works on our behalf. Remember, he fights our battles. He goes before us. His spirit can go within people. His spirit can work in the heart of man. 
So, as he finally surrendered this to God, God went and dealt with Esau, I believe. And so when he finally now had to, to, conf to confront Esau, Esau had a warm heart towards him. And they actually embraced each other. And the conflict was gone. When we walk with God, walking with man becomes easy. If we just simply walk with God, walking with man comes easy. It's when we walk separate from God that it becomes difficult. But if God is in us, we see everyone different. When Jacob saw Esau, he said, "Is as if I saw the face of God. Now his brother, who he had such negative thoughts towards and such fear towards, it was totally different now that he saw him. Now he saw him and he saw the face of God. When we walk with God, when we look at each other, we see God in each other. See, we see from above and not from beneath. We see for looking down rather than looking up. And what we see is we see God in everyone. Because we are all made in the image of God. Amen? And so, a lot of times, the, the difficulty we have in conflict is because of the wrong perception of the person that we're looking at. Because of the hatred in our heart, the bitterness within. But when that removed, we see the person totally different. Amen? Amen. Last little part here about Jacob. In Genesis 35, Jacob now takes his family to, um, to, uh, to Bethel, where he visited before, where he had an encounter with God, and, and this Bethel means the house of God. So he took his family to the house of God. And he got his family in order. He had them remove all idolatry. Because he was called to his family first. And so he cleaned up his household. And as he did that, then God now showed up to him again. Reminded him, or gave him the same word that he gave his forefathers, Abraham and Isaac. I will bless you, Jacob. I will bless you and make you a great nation. And even nations. And your name will no longer be Jacob, but your name is now Israel. Jacob was transformed. And now the call of, on his life was now to be transformed and to transform others. Next slide. So transformers. More than meets the eye. Is there more than meets the eye when somebody looks at us? Can they see Christ within? Do you ever hear stories of your past? Anybody here ever hear stories of your past? Somebody, you know, you haven't seen for a while, you get together and you start talking about the old days, and they bring up things and you're like, was that really me? Could I really do that? It happens to me all the time. I mean, I can't even, even when I was just newly saved, you know, my wife and I were talking, or somebody was talking, I don't know what it was, but we were talking about some of the things I did when we first met. I was like, oh my goodness. Really? Was I that? <laughs> wow. You know, we changed so much through the years through Christ that I can't, I can't even imagine that that was really me back in, you know. Isn't it amazing how God transforms us? Amen. Well, spiritually, we are a different person. The Bible says we are brand new creatures in who? Christ Jesus. Old things have passed away and all things become what? So first of all, again, like Jacob, as we are transformed, we're now to start with our household. We're to make sure that all idolatry is removed from our house. And then God calls us to now establish a lifestyle of worship as a family. God is all about the family unit. The strength of a church is in the family. So we have to deal with our family above all. First of all, us and then family. And then beyond family, God has now called us to the nations. Amen? And we see the Great Commission as Jacob, as God com commissioned Jacob to make a great nation, which is Israel, 
We are now commissioned to disciple the nations. Amen? The Great Commission, Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, commands us, and as that, that slide says, it's not an option to be considered, it is a command to be obeyed. The Great Commission is the great command by God to disciple nations. So God has called us not just to be transformed for ourselves, but to transform our family and then transform the world, transform the nations. And that's not just for a few, that's for all of us to have an impact. And our nation, the United States, needs transformation. Do you agree? And if that's going to take place, it's going to take place because of all of us together. Amen? Obeying that command. So we need to let God take us through the process like Jacob where we get past ourselves to the point where now we're changing the world. And I believe that is the end of the message. That is Jacob wrestling with God, part two. Next week we'll get into Jonathan. I mean Joseph. So as we, as I pray, and as we continue in worship, worship team, you can come back up. Let's just ask God as we continue to worship, where are we at? God, what are you doing in our hearts right now? What area are you trying to work out of us? If there's areas that you're struggling with, like Jacob struggled, you just need somebody to touch and agree with, to pray over, I, myself, and others will be up here to pray with you. Let's just leave this place tonight freer than we came in. Let's have an encounter like Jacob had with God. Amen. So, Father, we just thank you, Lord God, for your word tonight. We thank you for the example of Jacob. What a life that we see transformation in. Lord, we thank you for our lives and how you're transforming us. But, Lord, tonight, God, we're not satisfied where we're at. So we want to come and humble ourselves before you. And say, Lord God, here I am, God, your servant. Change me even more. May I decrease so that you may increase. Show us, reveal to us that area in our life tonight that we need to surrender. And let us become more like you. And we give you all glory, honor, and praise tonight. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. God bless you.